Hello and welcome back to the Futurism at Cheju podcast. Yeah, sorry, I'm just trolling you guys. So today I actually have a very special speaker, and it's actually my sister, hello. Christina. Hi everyone. So say hello to Christina. She's almost exactly four years younger than me. So I'm a junior in college, and she's a junior in high school, and she's visiting me at Hopkins. She's doing her college tours right now. Mm-hmm. And she decided to come on the podcast. It wasn't my idea. So, you know. So so why did you want to be on the podcast, Christina? I mean, I love what everyone's doing on the podcast. I love the different things that you're talking about. Wow, the, the audience loves you. Oh, well, thanks. Um, and yeah, really excited to be here and talk about the future. Which is very, very interesting. Wow, the audience is going crazy for you, Christina. I should have brought you on earlier. No wonder. Wow. You're going to accelerate our views significantly, aren't you? I feel very special right now. (laughs) Anyways, so today's episode has literally zero plan. So if you don't like spontaneity, click off now. No, just kidding. If you don't like spontaneity, um, I don't know what to say, but we're just going to be spontaneous and we're going to enjoy if you, what? What I was happened? just to say, we're going to be spontaneous like the future. The future cannot be predicted, and this podcast cannot be predicted. That's that's a very valid point, right? Like, as much as we try to predict the future, you can never truly predict it. So... And this is just to be like a one-on-one conversation with, you know, whoever's watching out there. Um, you know. Yeah, all the see. siblings out there, right? This is your this is your opportunity. Go start a podcast <laughs> with, your, with your brother or sister or whatever. <laughs> right? <laughs> do you think yeah that'd be pretty funny yep so you know we were thinking we had we had a few options we could do an asmr uh video asmr podcast that'd be interesting actually i've I've, you know that'd be a very original podcast you do a podcast that's like asmr so and you could do that in your future you would be grateful for it because you would get a good night's sleep exactly or hmm we could do what did we say? We said future of education, although we've already done like two episodes on that. So, and then we also said chat GBT, but we've done an episode on that. But, um, uh, yeah, we're just also, I don't know. I don't know. I mean, you know, how about, how about, for? you know, let's just talk about what the let's hear it. Yeah, like. let's hear it. Let's hear it. So you're four years younger than me. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't know. Let's just hear your thoughts on the future. I mean, I would say that I'm optimistic for the future. I definitely think there's going to be new technology. Dang, they're going crazy for you, Christina. Wow, thank you. Thank you, guys. Really appreciate it. Um, I do think that, you know, with new technology that's, you know, coming out and, you know, more life-saving medicines being created, I do think that the quality of life will increase in some ways. However, you know, we're going to reach overpopulation you know, the earth can o- only handle so much. And so I'm worried, I'm worried, yeah, about the future. So it's it's an it's in-between sort of perspective. I'm really hoping that, you know, we have a good future and that our grandchildren, our grandchildren and their grandchildren, you know, really can live on this earth with harmony and respect the earth um, and really take take everything um in and really appreciate what we have on earth because you know there's no other planet like it so if you had the choice let's say you had a time machine Mm -hmm. and you had one shot right it would take you to either a year in the future or a year in the past you have one shot so there's no going back what would you choose definitely a year in the future okay what year um, I would say 150 years from now. So what would that be? That would be 2173? Yeah. And why sure. is that? That's very, that's oddly specific. You didn't say 100. <laughs> you didn't say 200. You said 150. I think in the next 100 years, there's going to be an, an abundance of, um, you know, new technology um, maybe even new ways of thinking. Um, and 
you know, I think between like, you know, 100 and 200 is a good year. And I don't, I don't even know if the earth will be able to sustain humans for more than 200 years in the future. I don't know, but I think 150 years to see where we're at and the progress that we made to take it back to the present now and see how much further and how much quicker we need to work towards a more sustainable living and preserving our earth would, would be the best. Here's a question for you. Mm -hmm. If you went forward 150 years, do you think humans would still be here? I do think humans will be here uh, for another 100 years. How many? How many 100 years? or 150? You said 150 years into the future. Do, but do I think that humans will be here will, for... Will humans be here 150, in 150 years? And if so, how many do you think will be here? Mm, good question. I think it depends. I don't know. And in what state? Like, right. is it going to be like nuclear apocalypse? Or is it going to be like, oh, right. wow. Utopia, or not utopia, but something better than what we currently have. You know, unfortunately, I think that it, it, you know, the world could look extremely different. I don't know how many humans there would be. I would think that it's definitely less than the population we have now, right? We how many do we have now? We have about. Uh, we have. I think we just crossed the eight, eight billion. Mil yeah, eight billion mark. So yeah. <sighs> you know, definitely, definitely will not look the same and you know I for some reason I always think of um the giver when I think about the future for some reason and thinking about there's so many different ways the world could evolve it could be you know obviously technology wise but it could also be again what I just said the way of thinking and the way we perceive each other I'm hoping in 150 years that there will be, you know, full equality. I don't, I don't know. If, I think it will take longer than 150 years. But maybe our societies advance so much that we, that we understand each other to the point where we're able to work together in the most efficient ways and can look at situations in a new light and not always being attacking each other and not threatening each other with war and not being in a hot, you know, hostile situation where, you know, we're constantly, you know, hating on each other and, you know, going hating. after... Hating, hating, right? Just to clarify. Yes, what, what did I say? I don't know. It sounded like hating on each other. <laughs> oh. I was like, wait, hold up. Oopsies. Again. Hating on each other. Hating on each other. Yes, I agree. Yeah. So, you know, that's, that's what I'm thinking. All right. I got a two-parter question. Okay. One, I, I think about this a lot, actually, and we've had an episode on the future of war. So I want to ask you, mm -hmm. especially as a kind of humanities and history buff that you are, do you think that violence and war are inevitable? That's the first part of the question, so you can answer that first. Mm -hmm. The second part of that question, actually it's a, kind of a separate question, is what do you think is the greatest threat to humanity? Is it that our, or is, is, is the greatest threat to humanity our inclination towards violence and war so those are my that's a two-parter okay. question mm -hmm. and i'm curious to hear your thoughts especially from your more educated history perspective just for context to our listeners i definitely need to read up more on history <laughs> my sister yells at me all the time for not educating myself more she's absolutely correct i probably spend more time thinking about the future than i do thinking about the past but i think <laughs> the past is arguably just as important, if not more important, to think about because in the end, the past is what ends up what ends up shaping our future, right? Yes, Humanity is in this... Yeah, right? Like, I mean, you, you would probably agree with this, but, like, mm -hmm. throughout history, humans kind of make the same mistakes over and over and over, right? Yes, like, there's been so. violence and war mm -hmm. from the beginning since we were, since we were of created. humanity. So, mm -hmm. again, I want to hear your perspective on this. Is violence and war inevitable and second is that the greatest threat to humanity or is something else the greatest threat you know unfortunately i do think that violence and war is inevitable because it's in you know our blood and our ancestry um you mean because the first humans were also violent 
because it's, they had to be violent to survive. Sorry, let, let me rephrase. Is that it's, what you're saying? It's in our nature. Does that make sense? But what I'm saying is, is mm-hmm. it in our nature because we had to be violent to survive? I think because humans are, you know, they're unique in the way that they have, you know, They have what? <laughs> Sorry, let me, let, me, let me regain my thoughts. You know, we have these emotions. And we also, I feel like humans have like a sense of, or some humans have a sense of, you know, wanting to. <laughs> All right. I don't know what my sister's doing. I'm sorry, guys. One second, one second. One second. No, no, no. It's just, it's just, I'm just adjusting the volume. I said to keep going, though. Anyways, so. No, I'm not done with that, with that conversation. No, you know that you can, you can, um, sorry, quick intermission, guys. Actually, we should do an episode on this of how all the equipment works. Can you stop messing with it? So I've, I've learned the hard way. If you guys keep hearing like this. <laughs> If you keep hearing that, that's because she keeps tapping the table and moving <laughs> stuff around. The mics are very sensitive that we use. We use these Rode mics. I think we should do an episode on how we make a podcast episode, right? Because we, we started with the phones. We went to these mics. We actually just, these are brand new mics. This is our first episode using these brand new mics that we got from uh, funding from the CLE who sponsors us. And they're very sensitive. So if you just like tap on the table or shift around or move, they'll pick it up. So okay, just thank saying. you for that. Can I? Can anyways, I <laughs> so future episode. Just remind me, the future future episode will be how does a podcast episode work? How do we film it? How do, what does all the equipment look like? Maybe tips and tricks. I'm not an audio or podcast master, but I've kind of like picked up some you know instincts around you know, best practices, but anyways, keep going. Okay, thank so you. So I was just, I was just muting myself because I want to type something in my computer because I want to look something up. It's a very interesting okay. quote, which we'll get to, but keep going. I'm going to mute myself. Oh, right. So hopefully it doesn't pick up me typing, but anyways, keep going. Okay, sounds good. I was talking about, you know, humans are very unique and I think that there's always some sort of, yeah, for, for some humans, there's like this drive to be better than others and to have more power. And I don't think that's just going to go away, unfortunately. I mean, again, we could, we could also talk about what a perfect society looks like for us. Personally, I don't exactly know what that looks like, but, you know, yeah, it, it's, it's hard to see that that would just, you know, just go away. I don't think so. And, you know, especially with, more nuclear power and more destructive technology coming out it's very scary actually nicholas i don't know if you have watched the new james bond vid- um yeah james bond movie um i kind of think of that of like mass destruction and using you know people's dna to target them and kill them um, that's, that's extremely scary for me, and unfortunately I think that may be a thing in the future. I hope not, I really do. I really hope that, you know, it doesn't come to the point where science is, I mean, no, I think, I think in some ways we are at that point where science is being used for mass destruction, you know, the nuclear bomb as an example. Um, yeah, use a lot of different background scientists to, you know, they killed a lot of people, unfortunately. But yeah. And then what was your second part of your question? Is violence and war the greatest threat to humanity or is something else? <laughs> um, I, I, you know, would it be too simple or not? Not too simple, but. I would say humanity is the greatest threat to humanity. 
I've heard that before. That's I really like that quote. I think actually John said that once, one of our co-founders. Mm-hmm. You know John. He said that as well. Yeah. I think that's a very good I mean, quote. Wait, can I, can I add in something? Saying that, saying that hu- humankind is the greatest threat to humankind also includes, you know, our nature for violence or war or being an alpha or being a power. So there's so many different things that combine. So you're not wrong in saying and asking me, you know, what what your um, second question was because it's it's part of what humans are or who humans are. <laughs> well, I think I think the way I would answer that question is for the first part, I I don't think it's inevitable. You know why? Mm. Because we have zero need for violence and war. Like truly. Like, okay, first of all, okay, maybe it's not true for mm, I don't know what the exact breakdown would be, but many 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 humans are not you know in the wild trying to survive you know worrying about getting their next meal or worrying about getting eaten by a mountain lion or something like that obviously people have you know food insecurity and face a lot of you know struggles that you know for you know someone like you know me or my sister or like you know we we're more we're very aware of how lucky we are and how privileged we are right to to not have to not have to worry about like the next meal on the table and things like that Mm -hmm. but that being said overall humanity is now the dominant species on the planet right at the start we weren't and i think that's part of why we were so violent is because you have to be right in in nature nature is like brutal Mm -hmm. it's absolutely brutal like if it you're, is. it truly is, yes. Yeah, I was watching a, a documentary on this, and this guy was I like, too. "I see nature, excuse my French, as a shit show. Like it's an absolute shit show." It is. It's pretty right. It's pretty it's, gruesome. It's gruesome. Like you watch those nature yeah. documentaries. I used to always like cover my eyes. I was like, "Holy crap! Animals mm-hmm. are like mm-hmm. ruthless to each other." Mm-hmm. So it's it's really tough out there. But humans are now on you know pretty much every corner of the earth. We're the dominant species on the planet. We don't have to worry. I mean, like right now, we're just sitting, you know, in my apartment and we're not worried about, you know, being eaten or something. So mm, it's, it's... But there are other looming threats. Like? <laughs> like nuclear war. But what I'm saying is... Like armed weapons. But what, what I'm saying is, instead of worrying about other species, humans decided to turn on themselves for zero reason. Mm-hmm. And I think part of that is what you were you were kind of alluding to before is the polarization, like the us versus them, right? So like, let's say we started off with, you know, a couple of humans and then they reproduce or whatever. Mm-hmm. Let's say you have 10 humans and then, you know, they decide to split off, in, split off into groups and all of a sudden you have two groups and they see each other not as equals. Mm-hmm. And so that sets a tension and then that can eventually set, you know, lead to violence so how is that not inevitable then well i'm just i i'm just saying it's i i okay i'm gonna take a moment right here to highlight you're playing devil's advocate no i want to highlight how much i appreciate my brother because he's very optimistic no, 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 no 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 i'm not trying to be optimistic I'm... i think you are and i appreciate it okay listen I used to be very a very optimistic person. You still as are, I've though. been no, I still am yeah. overall. But that being said, I'm not quite as optimistic as before, mm. because I think as you grow older, you become less and less optimistic as you kind of go through, I don't know the reality of things. Right, as a child, you're very shielded. Mm-hmm. I'm still very shielded, but I'm less shielded than I was before because mm-hmm. I've you know realized more things. I think you probably. I don't know if this is true of all younger siblings, but younger siblings tend to kind of grow up a little quicker just for whatever reason. I don't know if it's they kind of, you know, pick up on their older sibling or kind of adjust to their behavior or whatever it is. But my, my point is that I just don't think we have to kill each other. That's, that's my point. I don't think we have to be so violent 
because I I do we're agree still, on that. Yeah, I'm just saying I'm just saying we don't have the thing is we don't have to but the thing is we do. That's true. So I feel like the when I think of inevitable, I think sometimes almost like like there's no way to stop it. And if you really think about it, I don't think there's any way to really stop it. It takes one person to ignite violence. Yep. We talked we talked about this in our podcast. All it takes is one person. It's true. And again, on the flip side, all it takes is one person to make a great change. We talk about this all the time at school. You know, all only one person needs to speak out and you know, make a difference in this world. But it's true that only one person can also make a bad difference in this world. You you know what I'm saying? Kind of. Yeah. No, I see what you're saying. I don't know. I think it's this like, um, maybe almost ignorant optimism in me that wants everyone, you know, I want like, you know, fully peaceful world. I want everyone to get along. I think, you know what I mean? I think a lot of people do too. And I do too, but Sadly, it's it's hard sometimes to imagine it. I just I I'm I'm trying to get to the root of it. Like, is it a power thing? Mm-hmm. Is it? I mean, to me, it might be power. Actually, I think now that I'm thinking about it, talking about history, it it's multiple different things. It, it's like you, wanting stuff. It's greed. Is it greed? Is it power? Like, what it, is the? It goes back from the first cell that created life. It's always about this again. What you talked about needing to, you know survive and when humans you know became more and more intelligent it was you know the resources the groups you know and as civilization got more advanced then it was you know hierarchies and classes and ranks and it was who can stay alive who is more you know proper who has more money who can afford things who can afford education you know it there's so many things and it I there's no one root in my opinion. I think there's so many different sources and I feel like, yeah, there's like a multitude of sources and it's it's so hard to just say this is why. You know, you know what I mean? Yeah. Alright, I'm gonna I'm gonna read a quote. It's kind of related. I may have I may have read it before in another episode. Um, you ready for this? All right. This is from one of my, actually, this is, this is the, um, scientist. His name is Dr. David Eagleman. I had the pleasure of talking with him once, which was amazing. Um, but he's a neuroscientist who has, you know, made a bunch of, um, uh, educational kind of brain related episodes on PBS. He has a PBS special called the brain with David Eagleman. He also has several books, and this quote is from one of his books called Incognito, and it's a very good book. And here's one of the quotes in the book. I think this was the most powerful quote in the book for me. Okay. So listen to this. Mm-hmm. And this might, this might get to the question of what is the somewhat, what is the root cause? It also might be a little, not controversial, but maybe kind okay. of controversial. You'll see why. Mm-hmm. If you think genes, sorry, quote, if you think genes don't affect how people behave, consider this fact. If you are a carrier, don't read ahead. Oh. <laughs> Have you read ahead? Do you already know the plot twist? No, I did not read ahead. Okay, don't read. Okay. I want, I want you to hear this. I was just reading with you. If you are a carrier of a particular set of genes, the probability that you will commit a violent crime is four times as high as it would be if you lacked those genes. Mm-hmm. You're three times as likely to commit robbery, five times as likely to commit aggravated assault, eight times as likely to be arrested for murder, and 13 times as likely to be arrested for a sexual offense. The overwhelming majority of prisoners carry these genes. 91.8% of death row inmates do. So do you have any guess what these set of genes are? Mm. so isn't that interesting so there's a particular set of genes that make you a far more violent person to be honest i'm not surprised 
but do you know what this set of genes is? Have you heard of this before? That there's a, there's a specific set of genes that makes you more violent. Oh no. Have you heard of this? No. Okay. Well, here here's the plot twist. By the way, as regards to that dangerous set of genes, you've probably heard of them. They're summarized as the Y chromosome. If you're a carrier, we call you a male. I don't know. I, when I read it the first time, I was like, oh, my God, mind blown. I was like, oh, no. wait, what is a set of genes that I've never heard of? And then I realized, oh, Y chromosome. That's interesting. Oh, no. And I think, actually, now that I think about it, so was that a surprise? Were you expecting something else or did you have, did you think it might be the Y chromosome? I, what I was thinking was it's some sort of original genes. I didn't think it was the Y. Isn't that funny? Was, mm. Like, it never struck me. The first time I read that, I was like, oh, my God. That's like a very powerful way to put it. But I think we had talked about it in a previous episode, and I think it kind of went down to evolution again. It, it mm, uh, kind yeah. of went back to evolution in terms of, you know, maybe it's a little bit, again, this is why I say it's a little controversial, maybe, um, because men, you know, back in the day, obviously we're all, you know, kind of striving towards this, you know, equality and equity. Mm -hmm. But back in the day you know, like it or not, men were typically the people who were hunting, who were, you know, doing like violent things. Mm -hmm. And so that could be the reason why maybe that's there's an evolutionary basis to why men and why the Y chromosome being a carrier for the Y chromosome being a, a mm -hmm. male is or, or makes you so much more susceptible to being violent. So what do you think from an evolution and biology mm -hmm. perspective? Do you think that's the reason why is because men tended to be the people who were killing and hunting and doing these violent things. And somehow that's translated over to violence within, not necessarily for survival, but violence just within, you know, society. I do think that, yes, that, you know, in the, in the past, the men were the ones that did the more violent tasks. Um, it's, it's, it's very, again, I also think this is a bit contro controversial because, you know, definitely in the past, you know, people have made it, sorry, let me, let me scratch what I was saying. Basically, people have been using the, like this idea that I think this needs to be edited out because I don't know what I'm saying. That's no, okay. Keep going. I I'm basically trying to say that I think that women and men. This comes from my feminine side, are equal. However, yes, you know I think that there always has been some sort of evolutionary side that has meant that has made men more violent um and well needing to violent needing to protect the family needing to you know be all alert and you know if an animal attacks how am i gonna you know protect my family how am i going to you know get them out how, how are they gonna survive so yeah yeah i don't know I, I mean, <laughs> I don't know. I don't know what to say other than I think everyone should read this quote. Yeah, <laughs> everyone should read this book. I think I think that to me is why I study neuroscience mm. is because in the end. So when we talk about what's the root cause of all of this, in the end, it comes down to the human brain, right? It's all in the brain. And that's why I study neuroscience, because the brain is responsible for everything we do. It's it's the most powerful known object in the universe. And you know, for better or worse, it's evolved into something that is highly complex. It allows for you know this, you know, consciousness or or facade of consciousness that we have, right? Where we've been able to kind of slip out or, or kind of expand beyond 
kind of the normal biological limits, I suppose. I mean, if you look at every other animal mm. in the animal kingdom or every other living thing on earth, they've not, you know, been to the moon or, you know, looked at, you know, distant galaxies or basically, you know, spread to every, I mean, some, some, some animals have spread to every corner of the earth, but they've not, you know, built skyscrapers or Mm -hmm. built incredibly complex and powerful electronic devices or (laughs) nuclear weapons or AI, things like that. Even, you know, even bad things. Yes. So in the end, it comes down to somehow our brains were able to evolve in such a way that allowed us to kind of Actually, I conquer just Earth. shout out to my AP bio teacher, who is amazing. We were just watching a video on, you know, how the human brain evolved. And something I did not realize is it has to do with the size of our skull and also the shape of our skull. Have you, you, have you gone over this? Well, it's all about surface area. Mm-hmm. Is that what you learned about? Yes. I'm trying to exactly remember like, exactly. Like we don't what have the about. biggest brains. I think dolphins have bigger mm-hmm. brains. Yeah, we do not have the biggest. And there's brains. other species too, but our brain but is the, the most w- dense. Mhm. Right? It yes. kind of goes to you know, you've always heard quality over quantity, right? Mm-hmm. Like our brains are quality in the sense that they're if you look at it like a brain, a picture of a brain, mm-hmm. it's very wrinkly and those are folds. And essentially that increases the surface area. So you're increasing the number of neurons or or brain cells in a given area. And so you're basically increasing your kind of, I guess, processing capacity. So yes, that, that is essentially the major difference between our brains and the rest, Mm -hmm. you know, other uh, mammals brains. Another thing that I think that every human should watch is how do we, how did our brains evolve? I mean, it's, it's mind boggling, but you know, yeah. And again, I'm so grateful to have been taking AP bio this year because a lot of things we're talking about mutations, you know, how do we evolve to be humans? You know, how did hierarchies be created? I mean, it's, it's, it's truly amazing to learn about. And again, no other animals or or creatures on this planet know like has this information. I mean, it's just it's just a big wow. Like it, it just takes it just you know, I feel in awe sometimes that humans figure figure this stuff out. <laughs> yeah. It's pretty incredible. I think we tend to focus on the bad, right? Because that's how we survive, right? You remember mm-hmm. the bad things that happen, right? Mm-hmm. Like, like from who childhood. cares? Yeah. Oh, yeah, that's true. I, I distinctly remember a lot of sad and m- moments where I was either scared or had anger or was, you know, very fearful. But that does not that doesn't go to say right. I I do have memories of being extremely happy and a warm you know, glowing over me, but yeah. Is your earliest memory Mm -hmm. a sad one or a happy one? Or like a negative one or a positive one? You know, I sometimes get confused with the amount of things I remember from certain ages. Because, you know, sometimes I do take, you know, photos and sort of remember memories from the photos. Um... However, I distinctly remember when I was age four, um, a drawer fell on me and it was extremely scary for me. I was climbing on the drawers, trying to go to the top uh, and, you know, be independent as a four year old and get dressed myself. Um, (laughs) And the drawer ended up tilting and it kind of crushed me a little bit. And my lamp shattered all around me. Um, And as a four-year-old, that's extremely scary. And I remember, you know, luckily my, I think my dad rushed in and my brother, I think my brother right here, Nicholas, rushed in first. And, 
you know, called for help and they lifted it up on me. But that was a terrifying moment. Um, and I also just didn't remember it because I told it in class as something that was really frightening and almost, you know, <laughs> for a four, four-year-old, kind of a life-changing moment in a way. Um, I never again climbed my doors. I learned my lesson, but, you know, goes to show that maybe, you know, certain first memories, again, are not not the happy ones. Yeah, it's I, funny. Yeah. No, go ahead. No, I, I just, I, I think I do have more, but I have to think about it. But that's the first one that comes to mind right now. I was going to say, it's funny that you mentioned four years old, because my earliest memory is actually when I was four years old. Mm-hmm. You probably know the story, too. And I do remember the drawer falling on you. But my earliest memory was I woke up one morning and my mom was cooking eggs in the kitchen. I don't know if you've heard this, actually. Mm-hmm. Actually, were you even born? I think you were a baby at this point. Mm-hmm. Uh, like a newborn. And I went into the kitchen because I was so, I was like, oh, it smells so good. I went into the kitchen and basically put my hand in the pan like the, the burning hot pan that my mom was cooking eggs in because I wanted to eat some eggs. I had zero patience. Put my hand in, and it took like a split second to realize that it was extremely painful, right? You have this, you, sometimes you, you know, you get an injury or something. There's like this split second before you realize, oh, shoot, like this hurts. Yes, I've known it too well, this is unfortunately. Bad. Like there's that like shock, like a very brief initial shock. And then you're like, oh my God, this hurts like really bad. So then I like took my hand out of the pan. It was like super red. I think we had to like run it under cold water and put Neosporin and all that band-aid and everything. Oh, side note. Hopefully yeah. it was lukewarm water because cold uh, water would be too shocking. Oh, I don't know. I don't know. I don't remember exactly. The point was my earliest memory is one of pain and yours is too. And maybe a little bit of fear. Mm-hmm. And so evolutionarily, that makes sense, right? Like if you're, mm-hmm. if you do something wrong, you make a mistake. Like, I don't know, you, I don't know, you leave food out. Like if you're, if you ever gone camping, if you leave food out, it attracts <laughs> critters, right? Yes. <laughs> Let's say you leave food out and you're like freaking like attacked by a bear mm-hmm. or something, right? You're never going to do that again. And you're going to remember that very vividly if you get out of there. Like, unscathed. I think this very much connects to epigenetics, too. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. And especially when I think about... So what is epigenetics? Because people may not know what that is. Well, Nicholas, would you like to explain? No. You're, you're the one in AP Bio. <laughs> <laughs> you're the um, one who mentioned the word. <laughs> Why don't we look up an exact definition so I don't, I don't get misinformation? All right. We're doing a quick uh, Google... So epigenetics, according to the CDC, the Center for Disease Control and Prevention, for those of you who don't know that acronym, (laughs) epigenetics is the study of how your behaviors and environment can cause changes that affect the way your genes work. And generations, how future generations genes work. And it says, unlike genetic changes, epigenetic changes are reversible Mm -hmm. and do not change your DNA sequence but they can change how your body reads a DNA sequence. So essentially it's talking about, if you've heard of like nature versus nurture, it's kind of talking about the nurture part of that. So nature is like our genes, our genetics, right? They're just, they're, they're pretty much fixed in the sense that you're born with them. There's not much you can really do about them. Obviously there's genetic modification, but that's a highly controversial topic that people are trying not to touch we're not we're not trying to genetically modify ourselves just yet really however there's a nurture part which nurture is basically your environment like how nurtured you were growing up or how not nurtured you were and i have something to add on later about that oh no go ahead no no no. please continue okay anyways the point is nurture is kind of your environment so like how were you raised did you grow up in Mm -hmm. a stable household did you grow up in a very unstable household? However, did you also grow up where there's pollution? Yeah, exactly. Were you exposed to toxins? Or did you grow up by pollution? Mm-hmm. Or, you know, any set of factors that could influence how you develop and how you grow up. For example, actually not, not, not necessarily um, a developmental thing, but 
if you're you know in college right now for example i'm a college student <laughs> and i'm surrounded by people who are extremely ambitious who are extremely academic but they're also stressed out overwhelmed anxious and that can affect me and so it, it, it kind of gets into um maybe the people you're around as well like your environment includes both kind of the physical environment you know pollution toxins things like that but i think more importantly the people you're around if you're around you know happy um, stress-free people then you're very likely to be happy and stress-free right because we're very good at influencing each other and picking up on our cues mm -hmm. if you're around stressed out overwhelmed anxious people you're more likely to be stressed out, overwhelmed, and anxious, mm -hmm. no matter what your genetics say. And that can lead to, again, epigenetic changes. So not necessarily changing your DNA itself, but changing how it's read. And, and I, I don't know the specifics of that. There's also a connection with this. Do, but do, it's interesting. Do you, do you know um, acetylation and methylation? Oh, yes. yes okay, so you do is... know the specifics of that. I do. I mean, I'm AP bio, so I should. <laughs> so what is methylation? Isn't Doesn't it have to do with turning genes like on it's like quote unquote actually on the histones. and off yes histones so, yes. yes you're right so basically it's about how so histones right they wrap around um Here, let's see i'm DNA. pulling up a picture sure so they wrap around histone yeah histones are like proteins it says histones are proteins around which dna can wind for compaction and gene regulation mm -hmm. it's according to wikipedia so, depending on how tight um the DNA is wrapped around, um, you know, DNA could either be, um, or like less likely to be transcribed or, um, more likely to be transcribed. And depending on that, different genes or proteins will be expressed. Um, so if I'm pretty sure methylation is, there's, um, less gene expression. So for example, if you need a protein that suppresses, um, you know, or a tumor suppressor gene or protein, and it's not being created, then, you know, you could have a higher chance of getting cancer, for example. And that could be from epigenetic changes that wind. There's many different, you know, epigenetic changes, but this is one, one of, for example, one of them, where, um, you know, it, the, the, you know, oops, sorry, I think I just, yeah, sorry for the tapping, guys. I just did something I wasn't supposed I'm, to. I am very much a culprit of all that tapping. But yes, so I'm, I'm looking at Wikipedia right now. I know Wikipedia is a, is a debated resource. I think this is another episode, but ChatGPT is also a very debated resource in terms of where the heck it's getting its information from. <laughs> mm -hmm. I was just watching a video where it's like, ChatGPT was not necessarily meant to be truthful. It was meant to have a conversation. And so... We've had an episode on this on like misinformation and the truth and just, you know, quick side note is like always be skeptical of what you read and think about where it came from. Yes, of course. And if it doesn't, if something doesn't seem right, like, like I, basically what I'm saying is don't take everything you hear as truth, right? Can like, I add on to that? Sure. This is this, now we're, now we're, we're going on a tangent here. We'll, we'll, we'll return to our tangent. brief intermission. <laughs> <laughs> we're going to go back to our epigenetics in just a second but i wanted to say that i that in my history class i actually wrote um like a paragraph or a page on how it's necessary to question what we read exactly what my brother's talking about especially with our history books because for many many years the wrong mis the wrong information has spread and so there's a lot of misinformation um, for example, about Reconstruction, about even slavery. For many years, history books have been um, toning down how horrible slavery is. And, you know, kids and even now adults now ha have this, you know, image and have this knowledge about what slavery looks like, for example. And it's completely false. So again, as my brother says, it's, you should always be questioning what you're reading, where it came from. Sometimes it's hard, though, because if your history books or your science book says something, you know, it's very easy to believe what is what is written. It's almost like, oh, there's no way that, you know, these authors um, 
and you know whoever published would publish misinformation but again always question that's really important well thank you for that wonderful intermission <laughs> now we shall return to epigenetics that epigenetics. that was a whole other episode actually mm. we talked about that very very interesting topic yes but yes epigenetics so i'm looking at this graphic on wikipedia mm -hmm. it says epigenetic mechanisms are affected by these factors and processes development so that could be in utero so while you're being yes um i guess born in a sense in the womb or not born but while you're developing in the where, womb where your cells multiply yeah. where your cells mul are multiplying and organs are forming and all that mm -hmm. and then childhood also environmental chemicals so that gets into the toxins and pollution we're talking about drugs and pharmaceuticals drugs and pharmaceuticals they tend to have a lot of side effects uh aging makes sense as you mm -hmm. get older things bad things not bad things but um negative things i guess start to happen um and that's just part of life i suppose and diet as well yes diet, i think that's actually a good diet one is a huge that's one. a very good one because i don't know if you guys have heard of the expression like the gut is your second brain there's this nerve so a nerve is like a, a bundle of um neurons you know brain cells essentially that have these really long um axons which are basically like strings and it goes there's a nerve that goes all the way from the brain all the way down to the stomach and it's like this highway and so your brain and your stomach are constantly communicating with each other i've heard this yeah yeah and so again like diet is very important if you're feeding your body the right things your brain and your body are going to be having a good conversation mm -hmm. if you're feeding it bad things maybe the conversation is not as good and obviously they're not literally having a conversation but they're communicating constantly and they're affecting each other and so i think epigenetics is is pretty interesting um i i mean i think it's see. extremely fascinating it's oh here it is yeah here it is so dna methylation this is where you add a methyl group methyl group i believe is nh3 hold on let me fact check this methyl group i think is an nh3 uh oh my gosh am i going crazy i'm sorry guys it's a ch3 <laughs> ch3 <laughs> what is nh3 oh nh3 is an amine i'm sorry i haven't taken orgo in a bit uh okay amine this is why again if i had said that and i hadn't fact checked myself I would be telling something that's not reality. And so again, yes, please fact, fact check. check. Yes. This is why I'm like, <laughs> let me make sure I'm not saying something wrong. Uh, ammonia and H3. Anyways, a methyl group is CH3. It looks like, or CH, R CH3. So it's like a carbon with three hydrogens and it's uh, bound to the rest of a molecule. So methyl group, or, or DNA methylation means adding that methyl group. And it says, a methyl group is an epigenetic factor found in some dietary sources. And it can tag DNA and activate or repress genes. Yes, it's about how so, tightly the DNA wraps around the histones. Okay, so I see. So if the histones are wrapped more tightly, it then means... You cannot, then transcription cannot occur transcription cannot occur and it looks or like this it occurs less life or it's like less likely to transcribe. yeah and it looks like the epigenetic factor cannot access that gene as easily it mm -hmm. seems maybe mm -hmm. is that what i'm seeing here it's okay. dna we don't we don't have to go oh i see so okay <laughs> i wish i could show you guys this graphic right now look this up on wikipedia if you have your you know phone or computer right now go look this up look up epigenetics if you click on the first image on Wikipedia, there's like this nice uh, image that says epigenetic mechanisms and it has like a whole... And it's purple, purple and blue. Yeah, and it says epigenetic mechanisms on the top left and it says health endpoints on the top right. Cancer, autoimmune diseases, mental disorders, diabetes. So look at this image so you can like kind of see what I'm talking about. But it looks like... So it looks like when the histones are wrapped around more tightly, it says DNA inaccessible, gene inactive. 
That's it says gene inactive, it means it's not being transcribed. That's what I'm saying. Yes. That's what you're saying. Okay. See, this is why I need to review my AP bio. Uh, AP bio is a great class. I so it has to do with so histone. Recommend. Histone. How, <laughs> how tightly histones are wrapping around DNA. Mm-hmm. Interesting. And then so. Yes. Is this saying, wait, histone tail. So when this epigenetic factor, this like orange thing, is coming in here, it's binding to, is that a histone tail? Oh, so the purple is a DNA. Yes. And the blue Are the is a histone. Oh, mm-hmm. wow. I was reading that backwards. I thought the mm-hmm. purple was the histone. No. Actually, that makes more sense. So, <laughs> all right. So you want to explain how that happens? What is the epigen- epigenetic factor doing? Well, there's tags. So there's, you know, depending where we're going, methylation and acetylation. Oh, acetylation, that's another thing. So what's yeah. that? Um, it, can, it, it allows for more transcription. So when they're not as um, tightly wound on the histones. Acetylation. Uh, what? You don't want to talk about this part? Okay, anyways. I think I think we're going on a little bit of a side tangent. All right, sorry, we're we're going into too much biology. Anyways, However, the point is, I do recommend epigenetics everyone, are cool. Please look this up. I I mean, again, I think biology I think, is amazing. I think I think the point of this episode was basically learn more history and learn more biology, <laughs> and learn more about the brain. I think those are like the two or three big takeaways. What do you think? Yes, I agree. I think, and right? there's something like, there's something I really want to end this podcast on. Sure. Do you have anything else to add? No, I think I think uh, again, study more history. I that's that's my homework for myself is learn more about history, learn more about you know human nature and war and violence and the history of war and violence, and <laughs> definitely review my biology. I should definitely know this as a neuroscience major, and uh, yeah, keep going with my neuroscience studies yeah but yes go for it shout out he is doing amazing things at jsu i'm trying i'm trying (laughs) (laughs) okay to end off i wanted to kind of connect back to you know everything we've been sort of talking about and specifically also about like epigenetic changes and um you know talking about how important childhood is I, I don't hear people talking about this enough. Um, and when I think back to who the person, like, you know, who I am today and the beliefs I have and the life I want to live, I really look back into my childhood. And I cannot appreciate enough, you know, the people in my lives, especially my brother right here, um, and my parents and my grandparents and my mentors, my teachers, because childhood is so important. It truly is, and I bet there's a, there's probably a lot of studies on this. And depending on you know how you grew up, where you grew up, or were you surrounded about, or were you surrounded around love, you know, or you were surrounded in a yelling family or a quiet family, it really impacts who you are as a person. And all I can say is, children remember everything. I remember you know people always say, oh my child will remember if I'm not showing up to this or that. And this is this about the future too, about our future generation. The more, you know, the more positive, I, in my opinion, you know, a child that is and, and you know, a child is surrounded around love, you know, I think the better person that child could, could become. So yeah, I just wanted to end in that, end the podcast with that. And yeah. Beautiful. Well, thank you, Christina, for coming on the episode. It's been a very, very um, deep episode. So I how I would describe it. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's been it's been very interesting because I'm I'm so used to talking with, you know, my friends and and the people who are part of the podcast, and I've never had a chance to talk with a family member, and it feels good. Yeah. So. You know, maybe my fourth take of it would be <laughs> <laughs> go do more stuff with your family because yeah. it's, 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 it's different. 
and maybe go re record a podcast session, maybe just for fun. I mean, you could keep it within yourselves. You don't have to publish it. But actually, we have done this before. Now that I think about it, we did a we were, we would record ourselves just like going on random rants. It was pretty funny, <laughs> but I think this was a little bit more high level than whatever <laughs> whatever the heck we used to talk about. But anyways. Thank you, Christina. You've been an awesome guest. Thank you, everyone. Maybe we'll have listening. you on in the future. I would love that. I know you're going to do great things. Hopefully, the college process goes well. Maybe you'll end up at Hopkins. Who knows? <laughs> I'm sure you'll end up at a great school. And to all of you listeners out there, go study biology, go study history and neuroscience. And study what you're passionate about, too. Study what you're passionate about, too. And hopefully keep listening to the podcast and mm. we hope you're you you are inspired or at least um get some interesting ideas from what we talk about and, and gain some value in your life that's that's in the end the whole goal of the podcast so again thank you christina thank really you, appreciate Nicholas. it and thank you <laughs> listeners and we'll see you on the next one bye bye